Modern medicine is incredible, but in the olden days, not so much. Welcome back to Bumblebee. I'm your host, Dana, and today we are talking about the top 10 medical practices that should be erased from history. At number 10, we have milk transfusions. Oh yes, people believed that would work. In the 19th century, doctors believed that the fatty oils, that the fatty and oily qualities of milk would turn into white blood cells and would help cure the patient. So of course, because of basic biology, this didn't work. Many of the recorded cases resulted in fatalities, but there were two documented cases in question that stand out. The first one being one of the patients they tried this on, their pulse stopped almost instantly. Another failed case, right? Nope, they injected the same patient with a mixture of morphine and fermented tipsy syrup and it actually resurrected them. And not just for a short while, for a full 10 days after the so-called transfusion. And somehow, that's not even the craziest of the two cases. The other case had a documented survival, meaning someone had put milk through their veins and their body processed it and deemed it good enough to let them live through it. Simply because of the mortality rate, it needed to be stopped. At number 9, we have soothing syrup. From 1840 to 1905, there was this little remedy called Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, and it was said to be a popular cure for babies who were having a hard time teething and having some bowel troubles. Well, the contents of the syrup consisted of morphine and extremely high contents of liquid you need to be of legal age to drink. After enough fatalities, there was a full investigation into the mysterious liquids, and Mrs. Winslow's syrup, along with many others, were condemned and were given the label that exposed them for what they were really doing. And in an article released after the investigation, it said, If you value your children's life and health, never use either of these preparations. This was an incredibly unfortunate event that needs to be erased. At number 8, we have smoking. Smoking cigarettes has been proven to be linked to many different health conditions and has been known to cause terminal illnesses. But in the 19th century, it was the bee's knees. Stressed? Smoke over it. Special occasion? Smoke. Going on a date? Smoke. People made it seem cool and fun when in reality, it was terrible for the human body. But they continued to upsell it, saying it could help cure asthma, and it wasn't disproven until a few years after the statement came out. It was also used as a remedy for earaches, saying that the gentle heat from the smoke would pop the eardrum and make the pressure stop, which also doesn't work. Another thing they tried were tobacco smoke enemas, because that makes perfect sense. It was said to cure cholera and would work better than any other drugs, but alas, it did not. So smoke doesn't cure anything and makes it worse. Let's hope history doesn't repeat itself on that one. At number 7, we have electroshock therapy. It was created in the early 1930s and was used on patients who expressed significantly more prominent symptoms of mental illnesses and would only be used when they weren't responding to other forms of treatment. They would put electrodes on the forehead and pass the electrical currents directly into the brain. This caused a seizure that would last for up to a minute. It would halt the symptoms of the mental illness, but it could also cause significant damage to the brain. The aftermath often included severe migraines, learning disabilities, memory issues, fatigue, and confusion. Thankfully, it was practically erased from history since it was banned from being used in practice due to its extreme nature. At number 6, we have the craniotomy. The procedure in theory is very simple. It's just drilling a hole into the patient's head to cure migraine seizures and severe mental illness. There's absolutely nothing that could go wrong with that. Except there was so much that could go wrong. This procedure had actually been documented from around 8,000 years ago, which is a really long time for practically nothing to progress. And it would usually be done with a handheld drill. However, when done wrong, it could leave a person fully disabled or cause a lot of cognitive problems. However, now it has been tailored to work properly, but still isn't recommended. It's now used to cure similar things, but on a much safer and more precise level. However, the risk of complications is still very prominent, even if it is technically safer. If it isn't deemed necessary, it shouldn't be done, and the fact that it is still practiced must be pretty stressful. At number 5, we have powdered sugar. 
for the sake of the video and what we aren't allowed to say on here, let's just call it powder sugar or flour and probably a few other synonyms so we don't get in trouble. It was used in everything, really. It was considered a remedy for hay fever because it cleared the nose and mind. And it was used as a cure for headaches because it made everything brighter and clearer. It was put in soft drinks like Coca-Cola and was said to help housewives work harder and faster for longer because they simply had more energy because of it. Powdered sugar was considered the wonder drug. When it was made into liquid, it could be used as eye drops because it had the same effect as topical anesthetic. This made headlines and started to be used in eye and sinus surgeries. After this, it came in fill f pill form to cure the blues, and it came in paste form to help with toothaches, and was even sold from Sears catalogs. You can believe this caused a lot of addicts, up to 60,000 in America alone. In 1914, it was outlawed for the health of the country. If only we could erase that from our history. At number four, we have the cure for female hysteria. In the 19th century, male doctors discovered the at-home cure for what they thought was a disease called female hysteria, where they would get extremely emotionally unstable and have mood swings, fatigue, and be bloated, because that's not normal at all in anyone. They traced this back to ancient times when they were called wandering wombs, which caused a woman physical illness because the womb was unhappy. So in the Middle Ages, they had a doctor solve the issue manually, but it wasn't until the 19th century that they discovered a way for women to do it themselves to save them the trouble. So the doctors invented an interesting item that was inserted and performed an internal massage that would please the uterus and the woman would have what was called hysterical paroxysm and she would be cured. Phew, we were worried they would never find a cure for completely natural things. However, it did pave a way for a very niche type of business. At number three, we have lobotomies. A lobotomy was a procedure where a doctor would open up the skull and remove part of the brain that caused extreme emotions. Walter Freeman thought he found a way to alleviate the pain and stress of the mentally and emotionally unwell. He actually took inspiration from the craniotomy, as well as from another developing procedure he had read about. Walter teamed up with another doctor by the name of James Watts, and they practiced developing their procedure together on donated bodies of the deceased. They performed it for the first time on a woman who was complaining of depression and sleeplessness in 1936, and it was considered successful. But many of their other procedures were not, and would leave the patients in a vegetative state, or regress their physical and mental state. However, Walter performed almost 3,500 lobotomies across 23 states, and he was only allowed to continue because he made difficult mental patients easier to deal with. Not only is it extremely immoral, but it deserves to be removed from our history. At number two, we have unnecessary amputation. Having limbs amputated is one of the oldest known forms of a medical procedure, but oftentimes it's taken too far and causes more harm than good. In the very beginning, it caused a lot of fatalities because they hadn't established closing off major arteries in order to keep as much blood in the body as possible. When that was introduced, there was still no anesthetics, so the patient couldn't be put under, so they had to undergo the traumatic surgery completely sober. That also meant it needed to be done as fast as possible, which was very stressful for the person performing it. And everything had to be done in one cut, which was also incredibly difficult. Of course, we wouldn't have figured out how to do it in a much less painful and less traumatic way without following the, the gruesome stepping stones to success. But looking back, if it was very small things that could have been easily dealt with on a small scale, having a whole limb cut off seems a little drastic. And last but not least at number one, we have barbers practicing medicine. Of course, this one takes number one because what does a man who cuts hair know about surgically fixing human body parts? Well, it started thousands of years ago when surgeons and physicians were very different jobs. Physicians would simply give you their opinion on what you had based on their prior knowledge of what they've seen before. And surgery was considered beneath them because they only worked with the nobles and the wealthy who were rarely injured. So barber, sur barber surgeons came to be because they had good enough hands with sharp tools. So they had to deal with basic workplace wounds like deep cuts and burns, as well as more life-threatening ones. But that was for more experienced barber surgeons. 
They would also perform other doctor-like tasks like pulling teeth, delivery babies, cauterizing, and many others. Of course, we're happy we don't get stitches from someone who never really went to school to learn how to do that, and we're happy that our surgeons don't come in wearing someone else's hair. So it's safe to say that we are happy that they are two different professions. And that has been our list for today. If you enjoyed this video, you can leave a like or a comment down below, and if you're buzzing for more content like this, you should follow the channel. I have been your host Dana, and thank you for tuning in to Bumblebee.